We'll be starting in just a moment, but for those who have already logged in, welcome to our roundtable discussion on library discovery and access in the post-COVID hybrid world. We're really excited to have you joining us today. Okay, well, uh, for those who've just joined, thank you so much uh, for attending today's session on library discovery and access in the post-COVID hybrid world. Uh, my name is Courtney McAllister. I am one of the conference directors for Charleston, and I'll be here to just handle a couple of the administrative details for today's session. Uh, Leah Hines sends her best. We have a really exciting session today. Um, before we get started, I wanted to go over a couple of administrative details. Uh, first of all, the session will be recorded. Uh, so if you have to leave early or if you weren't able to join us live today, uh, you will get a copy of the recording afterwards as a registrant. Um, we will be saving questions for the end. Uh, please feel free to pop your question either in the attendee question section of Zoom or in Q&A, uh, and we look forward to hearing your questions at the end. Uh, we also will be sharing a short attendee evaluation. If you have a few moments uh, to share some thoughts or ideas with us uh, about today's session in particular or about things you'd like us to address in the future. Uh, we thank you for any insights that you may want to share. I'm really excited to turn it over to our wonderful moderator and speakers uh, so we can get started with the discussion today. Uh, so I will hand things over to Tony Sanders. Thank you so much, Courtney. Thanks to Don at Charleston for coordinating this event. Um, and thanks for everyone for making time today for um, an important conversation on the topic of library discovery and access in the quote unquote post COVID world. And I'm saying that post uh, loosely here, um, but it's great for us to come together and talk about some of the work that's critical to the modern research library, um, which is mostly focused on meeting the needs of our ever changing um, patrons and our community at our libraries. Um, so we want to jump right in, but before we do, I want to make everyone acquainted to our wonderful panelists um, coming from the uh, Rotterdam, Netherlands area. We have Matthias van Ogem, who's the library director at uh, Rotterdam University. We have Aaron Gallagher from Gainesville, Florida, who's the chair of the acquisitions and collections department at University of Florida. We are also joined by Matt Hayes, who's the managing director from technology from SAGE, which includes Talas and Lean Library. And rounding us out is Talia Richards, the marketing director at SpringShare. And so today's exciting because we're gonna hear perspectives from the library operators who work directly with our patrons, but we're also gonna hear a different perspective from vendors that support those very same libraries. The goal here is to present multiple perspectives to you in the audience. And we hope that this generates some questions that you have for each of the speakers. We're gonna save some time at the end for a discussion because we wanna hear from you on how you're transitioning um, to this post COVID environment with regard to serving discovery and access for our, our patrons. So coming up first uh, is Matthias from Rotterdam. And um, I'm just, this is gonna be very conversational today. Uh, not everyone will have slides to present. And so we hope that you are able to just hear the firsthand experience of what different regions and different uh, libraries uh, and how they're responding to uh, this, this new normal. Um, so welcome, Matthias. Thank you, Tani. And good afternoon from Rotterdam in the Netherlands. My name is Matthijs van Odegem. I'm the director of Rotterdam University Library. Um, and I'd like to share with you some things we are, we're working on right now, some issues we have. I uh, hope to hear your thoughts about it. Um, and I didn't prepare a PowerPoint. I just wanted to share some ideas and some, some notions. Um, and I hope, oh, um, it may be useful for you and I hope to learn from you as well. So, so please type your questions in the chat or, and, and interact with us because, well, we're, we're amongst the specialists with each other. Um, so let, let me start to give you some context about Rotterdam University Library. Um, my university is quite young, it's 100 years old, which is quite young according to Dutch standards. Um, and we have a community of about some 40,000 students, which is in the Netherlands a medium-sized university. We have a strong research profile, 
um, focus on business and management. And I always like to tell that it's because of the history of my university. We were founded as a private initiative uh, from the harbor tycoons because Rotterdam is a large international harbor um, and it needed educated staff to work in their companies. And actually this, this start of the university, it's still very much the core in our collections today. So if you look at our collections, we have many e-resources, most of them in English, uh, but a lot of focus on business and management. Um, and as librarians, we're good in, in supporting our patrons uh, in, in discovery and access. Oh, and there we have some issues because when we do user surveys, we're not performing that well to admit it. Um, well, the awkward word is out. We're not very good at providing discovery services. Um, and I'm quite reluctant to say so because actually we, we don't do that much different than any other library I know. If you visit our website, you see this nice search box right in the middle uh, where you can directly key in your keywords, uh, have a button for advanced search, um, you have guides, you have an A to Z list, um, but my users don't like it. Okay, they use it, but they hate it, actually. Um, I just did a user survey. I just got the results on my desk. It actually, we finished this last week. Um, and and, and they, they really need a guide how to survive the library, um, which, is, which is awful. Um, and at the same time, I guess you will have the same problem as I have. At least I spoke about my colleagues and, and Mo. Most of them recognize this picture. Um, and actually, the COVID crisis has accelerated this issue. Because admittedly, it's not new. Um, apart from librarians, I've never met anyone who likes discovery services or search tools or library catalogs. We as librarians like them. I love them. Actually, I'm a book historian from, uh, from my education. But apart from me, nobody likes the library catalog. It's a useful tool. Okay. But that's about it. Um, and even though as a librarian, I'm so proud that everything in my collection uh, is in the library catalog, is in this search box. We have no backlogs whatsoever, but still my, my students don't like it. Um, and this is a trend that has been going on for quite a while. Um, so what we know, but we did when we first noticed it. At, at first you start tweaking your, your search tool. How can we improve it? Uh, and okay, we had some results. User satisfaction grew from 4.5 to a 5 on a scale to 10. So still not good enough. Then we thought, well, we, we should add some other tools. Um, and that was really, really helpful. So we noticed that our undergraduates really like this, this, these lib guides where we provide a guide uh, by, by, by discipline, where you have all the, the, the databases you need at that stage of your studies, neat and clean on one sheet. Um, that was really helpful. It didn't help our professors or, or research staff, but for our undergraduates, at least the first years, it was okay. Um, and then we added uh, the Lean Library plugin because we noticed that lots of traffic came from Google Scholar or the search engines. Um, and during the COVID crisis, the uptake was really, really good. So now we're on about 10,000 users, unique users a month, which is quite a lot for our, the size of our research community. Um, maybe Matt, Matt can tell a bit more about it, but I, I, I think we're doing quite well. Um, we added Browsing, which is a nice app for your mobile phone where you can uh, get your content pushed to your own device. Um, so we added all other kinds of, of tools to support our users. Um, and then we got another problem, because how do you balance your offerings? What, what is the relationship between your library plugin and browsing? What's the and your discovery tool and your libguide? Um, so actually, that's the question I have right now. And we're doing some research now on our user statistics um, to see whether, well, we indeed have this problem. Um, because users don't know which tool to use for which question um, and how we should solve this. Um, and actually, I think we are moving um, into a new paradigm. Um, I, I know that the, the, the library discovery as, as a one stop shop, and we were so happy when our old card catalog was transferred to our website uh, into a discovery tool. But actually, now we're moving more towards uh, what I call a multi channel approach. I, I borrowed the word from from our, from our marketing colleagues. They they are very much into multi channeling. It's very, very it sounds awesome. Um, but actually, I think this should be really helpful for our library strategy. Um, we do have different stakeholders with different needs, and we have different tools. So actually, the thing I'm working on right now is how to balance it. 
And I'm really curious to hear, learn your opinion about it. Um, and what we're seeing right now, I, I think we've got something. I think we should be working on this far more. And I, I wouldn't be surprised that by the end of this year, um, well, we have, we have have rebalanced our offerings. So that's, that's, a, that's a first kickoff for this, for this round table. Um, well, I'm really looking forward to our discussions. Thank you. Matthias, thank you so much for that sobering um, update. Um, it's just perfect timing that you received these survey results just last week. Um, and so this is hot off of the press, and I'm hoping that not only librarians and library workers are able to sort of compare notes based on your remarks, but also vendors. I'm hoping that vendors are here to um, be able to sort of learn and, and hear what students are experiencing right now. Um, you're taking me back to my days at Ex Libris and, and EBSCO where um, I was there for us to create user research roles um, and user experience roles specifically to try to solve this issue. And so I know that vendors are working hard to um, try to bridge the, the gap between the software they develop and the needs of the patrons. Um, and Because there is a gap there with the collections and, and library staff being the buyer. And so how do you sort of you know, have a direct connection to those users has been a, a challenge for vendors. And so thank you so much for sharing that feedback. Um, I'm curious if that's a regional issue, uh, Matthias is in Europe. Um, and I'm excited to hear from Aaron Gallagher, who's here in the United States at the University of Florida. Um, Aaron, um, give us some updates on how things are going with engaging your patrons with discovery and access. So first of all, I can tell you that these are not regionally specific issues because I was nodding my head the entire time Matthias is speaking. Uh, I can relate to a lot of this. And similarly to Matthias, I'm also not going to be using slides. So this is just going to be a you know a conversation. So first of all, good morning and afternoon or evening, depending on where everyone is. I'm Erin Gallagher, the Chair of Acquisitions and Collection Services at the University of Florida. And I'm also a Charleston director. I've been at UF for a little over three years, and I did hold roles in academic libraries before this, but full disclosure, I started out on the vendor side working for um, an academic library vendor doing collection development. So I've been on kind of both sides of the, the bookshelf. And the University of Florida is a very large public research intensive institution in Gainesville, Florida, which is not by the beach and is not in Disney World, um, but rather it's located in lovely North Florida swampland. And I also want to importantly acknowledge the Tamukua, Seminole, and other indigenous peoples who have lived, live, and recognize their ancestral connection to these lands since time immemorial. So the George A. Smathers Library System here, we support over 50,000 students, faculty, staff, researchers, and community members, including alligators, um, in teaching, learning, and exploration. And I'm serious about alligators. They really do live on our campus and you know, they're just part of the fabric of our lives. So I was asked to speak about challenges that we face with engaging students with library discovery and access in this post-COVID world. But honestly, everything that I mentioned could have applied to a pre-COVID world as well. And I would need another five hours to articulate all the challenges. So I'm just gonna focus on a few. And the first one I want to mention is resource bloat. So we have far too many redundant options for access and few of them perform similarly or predictably. So we subscribe to a vast cosmos of resources. And this is great because we want to provide a deep and broad um, you know, access to information for our user community. But out of that cosmos, people want one thing. They want one resource. And we present them with an A to Z database list of over a thousand links. And via library discovery, we present them with sometimes upwards of you know, 20 full text links that are supposed to be leading to the same resource. And they just want that thing. They just want that article. They don't care about whether it comes from Yale or Oxford University Press or someone's personal website. They just, they just want to get to that target. I'll also mention that constant product churn is very difficult for us to keep up with. This is something that's just inherent in the library systems market. Um, we are presented with new interfaces and 
facelifts and revamps and enhancements and upgrades. And um, often these seem to address cosmetic elements of usability over actual um, real usability. And usability is great. We want enhancements to be based on the user experience, but look at Google. We've probably all looked at Google today, right? It has looked pretty much the same since 1998. And it's a comfortable old shoe at this point. And our users don't have the same chance to gain confidence and develop comfort with library discovery systems, because just when they do, we pull out the rug out from under them and we migrate to something else. And then finally, I'll mention something that's really important and that's becoming, I think, um, a, a really good thing is that this is becoming more of a, a common conversation in our realm. And this is that there's a real lack of support for natural language or natural behavior searching in library discovery systems. And I mentioned Google, you know, I'll use the G word again. We all use it every day. Our user community uses it every day. So why should our users have to switch brains when they use library discovery? They need the ability to enter a stream of consciousness search string and retrieve relevant results based on natural language patterns. And if we take them down the path of learning Boolean operators and controlled vocabularies, we're losing them, y'all. And so I really believe that we need to map natural language to controlled vocabularies and make library discovery more accessible for contemporary users based on how they already access um, or, and seek out information in the wild. So all of these present challenges in illuminating the value of library discovery. It's very hard for us to invest so much time and labor on our end in building up the integrity of our systems. You know, as Matthias mentioned, you're constantly trying to tweak things and make improvements and make this thing more attractive and appealing to, to our users. But the reality is that that's a lot of work that still moves the dial just a tiny, tiny bit. Um, so, but things aren't all gloom and doom. I don't want to leave things on a, a negative note because we're constantly finding creative ways, y'all, to harness these systems to improve the user experience. Um, I also find it important to think more broadly about access and discovery as part of an ongoing continuum and not something that we are ever done with. So I really, again, I, I welcome the discussion and the Q&A that comes out from this. So thanks y'all for, for joining and listening. Again, thanks, Aaron, um, for distilling down um, uh, 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 an operating environment that was pretty much the same before COVID. Uh, perhaps we just had a, a bit more time to observe how cute it is. Um, to start the conversation with the audience, we actually have a couple polls that we want to have you participate in. And so I'm going to launch a poll. And we'll have you work through the first two questions of the poll during this uh, quick break. Um, and hopefully folks can now see um, the first two questions here. Uh, the first is, what are the biggest challenges that you faced uh, delivering library resources uh, to patrons? Um, we're curious to kind of get a sense, are the sort of obstacles you're facing related to your budget? Uh, are they more financial in nature? Um, is it the technical implementation of new tools? Do you, is it an expertise um, that you're uh, missing? Um, perhaps, I know that the industry is in this transition from um, everyone having their own systems librarian uh, to services now being hosted in the cloud. And so has that created some tension? Um, is it around communication? Um, both two-way communication, understanding what are those changing and rapidly evolving needs of the patrons uh, and, and keeping up to date with them or marketing and promoting those services to a new class of freshmen and, and, and an ever-changing uh, student body. Um, so we've already started to get um, a couple dozen, wow, a few dozen responses to the first poll question. Um, great. Perfect. So this is also a transition time. Um, we've heard so far from libraries who are have boots on the ground dealing with these issues with patrons and researchers directly. 
We also wanted to get a different perspective today from the vendors that are sort of helping libraries solve these problems. Um, to kick this vendor perspective off, um, I want to welcome Matt from um, Sage Lean Library in Talis to the conversation. Um, and so if you're ready to unmute and share your screen, Matt, welcome aboard. Thanks so much, Tony. And just looking at the responses, by the way, to this first poll, um, we also uh, put this, posed this poll to some Charleston delegates in 2021 and in 2020. And it's interesting to see the differences. For example, uh, back in November 2020, finding digital alternatives was overwhelmingly the biggest challenge, but it looks like that may have changed. Um, anyway, so I am going to share my screen. Um, because I wanted to share a few things with, with everybody. Um, so I'm Matt, I'm Managing Director of Technology from Sage, which includes Talis and Lean Library, both uh, SaaS products for the, the library sector. So speaking as a vendor, as Tony said. Um, and there are really two things I would like to contribute to this discussion. Um, the first is to share some findings of a report that we did last year at Lean Library called Librarian Futures, where we asked librarians and patrons about what their, their perspectives were of the future of the library and this idea of how we get the library in the life of the user. I think one of the audience uh, members just talked about Googletizing the library, so very much in that space as well. Um, and I also want to share with you a couple of um, new areas of product development we've worked on as part of this Lean Library Futures product, where we've tried to take our lessons from that research report and uh, broader lessons we've learned from librarians about how we can support patrons in this new, very much online world. Um, so the first uh, finding I want to share with you is just to probably validate your own experiences which is that um, we found pretty much universally that yes, the library's discovery service uh, is used very infrequently by patrons. So I think less than 20% of their discovery workflows begin uh, at the library's discovery service with the majority beginning, as you can see here on Google Scholar. Uh, in the case of Lean Library Data, that's about 50%. Uh, and we also did some work with students to look at what is their user experience when they're trying to access those library resources going through those non-library uh, derived routes, so from Google or Google Scholar. Uh, and this is a, vi a, a visual that, I, again, I'm sure just validates your own experience, which is what it's like uh, for a patron when they're off campus at trying to find uh, content that the library has access to via Google Scholar. Lots of clicks, lots of um, unfamiliar um, authentication tools for them, particularly as new undergraduates, and quite time consuming. Um, it's perhaps no surprise then that with that move to Google, Google Scholar, and sort of away from the library, the librarian is also an underused resource. So when we asked patrons what sources of information they most commonly use, librarians came relatively low down the list. And I think what's most striking here is that they are mentioned to the same degree as Wikipedia, but below things like news and media, faculty, peers, um, and of course, other things that you would expect them to rely on more heavily, such as their assigned course readings and other academic content. However, when we started to look beyond how they currently experience the library and how they would like to experience the library, what I think is really encouraging is that patrons really do want the library more embedded in their modern workflow. Um, so when you ask patrons, for example, if they would like to have library chat and library support with them when they're working online, um, not having to go back to the library website, but embedded in their workflow, 90% of patrons consider that to be desirable. And of course, librarians also very supportive of that. And some of the, um, anecdotal commentary behind that in one-to-one -one interviews, we found that patrons were saying, well, of course we would want the library to support us in our learning. That's part of why, particularly as undergraduates, we have gone to this university in the first place. 
we want the expertise of the university. We just want it in a way that's convenient to our workflows. Um, so what I want to show you here is um, how we've tried to translate this into a product as a vendor. So Lean Library Futures is a browser extension that integrates with the library's infrastructure and its services and content. And then we try to bring that into the patrons workflow when they need it. So in the case of this demand for patrons to get library chat and library support in their workflow, what you're seeing here is a patron on Google Scholar performing a literature search and then the libguide for literature review appearing then and then delivered via the browser extension. And we can also use this capability of other things like special collections um, or library discovery services as well. So you can try and bring in parts of the library where users are. Um, the other innovation we posed to patrons and to librarians was whether they would like the library's collection embedded in their workflow. So I think this might align a little bit with what Aaron was talking about as well, where you could try and bring in those technologies of NLP matching um, and also um, sort of syntax matching as well, so that when a patron is searching on Google, Google Scholar or other discovery tools outside the library, you can reference library collections that may be particularly relevant to that search. And you can see here that idea of embedding the library at that point of need is very desirable to both patrons and librarians. Um, and here is an example of, of how that would look. So what you can see here, just double check you can see all that. Um, what you can see here is a patron on Wikipedia using the browser extension to then highlight all the keywords on that page that map back to the library's collection uh, and then taking the user directly to that content that the library has subscribed to. So here, the term is visual research. They use the browser extension to call on the library's collection, highlight the keywords, and then bring in that content. Um, this is still very early stages for us because we need to really understand more about taxonomies and maybe how we could use things like NLP, but we believe this could really help um, improve that online experience for patrons. Uh, so that, that's what I want to talk about. So thank you very much for listening to that. I'd love to hear what you think. Thank you so much, Matt. This is a good opportunity to remind everyone to post questions to the Q&A. It's looking like we're going to have a good amount of time to address those in just a bit. Um, want to round out this portion of the dialogue hearing from Talia from Springshare. Um, this is another vendor that's trying to listen as, as much as possible to um, the experiences libraries are facing um, as they map out how does that impact the products and services they create uh, and deliver on a, on a global scale. Um, Talia? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm seeing a lot of familiar names, so, so hello, hello. Um, as many of you know, I've been here at Springshire for a while, but before that, I actually was an academic librarian um, at Johnson & Wales University in Providence, Rhode Island. So I get to um, uh, see both sides of the bookshelf as well. And pre-COVID, um, I think we've, we've all pretty much kind of come to the conclusion and research, research has reinforced this kind of again and again that students prefer library resources where they are. In the recent study that Matt has shown in, um, in the survey results that Matthias uh, uh, showcased, I think we're, we're, we're hitting that nail on the head <laughs> over and over. Um, and I think pre-COVID, we kind of came to the conclusion that they desire contextual targeted resources. They don't want a broad A to Z list of databases. Um, and you know, they don't wanna to have to scroll. They don't have to want to try and figure out. They're used to the Googleized experience as was stated earlier. They just want to be told what are the best databases for that class and for that assignment. Um, as one of the attendees noted, um, asking anything else kind of increases the cognitive load that we're asking of our, of our users. 
And, you know, I'm saying this now and we've kind of all come to this conclusion, but I presented on this topic back like in 2010 when I was a librarian at a, at a regional New England conference. And I, I almost got booed out of the room by, say, <laughs> by saying that, but I think we've all kind of come to this canon that we, we agree on this. And this is why we have seen again and again and again that course or even assignment specific libguides for those of you who are libguides users um, perform just way better than broad subject guides. Um, and, and we have data to show this, you know, Google Analytics shows time and again that the, the clicks are higher, that session duration, which is the average time a person stays on a website is higher for course guides than it is for subject guides, right? So, you know, and the and a recent, well, recent, back in 2017, an article um, by Jermaine in the Reference and User Services Quarterly called LibGuides for Instruction has stated that ensuring guides are effective requires the delivery of information and resources with learners, and this is the key part here, at their point of need, right? So this was all pre-COVID. And so now post-COVID, that really does not seem to be changing really at all. In fact, we're seeing a lot of other changes. We're seeing a higher percentage of non-traditional students. Um, you know, we're seeing students working multiple jobs, um, doing more online learning. Additionally, we're seeing um, an overwhelming volume of channels and noise, right? So not only are students having to navigate um, online learning in a way that maybe they haven't or haven't in a very long time if they're coming back to school, um, but they're also, they're, they're getting inundated with a lot of resources coming at them um, from multiple uh, multi-channels, right? So, so how are we addressing this at SpringShare? So first things first, some of you may already know that we have our LTI courseware integration, which allows you to embed right inside your courseware tool, Blackboard, Moodle, Sakai, Desire to Learn, so on and so forth. Um, you can embed course specific libguides, e-reserves, library chat, all of that right into the student's online course, right? So they're already inside their courseware platform. They don't wanna go elsewhere and having the library resources right there is going to increase your ability to reach them when they need it and of course where they need it. Um, just recently, we joined the IMS Global, which is the worldwide nonprofit collaborative that is dedicated to ed tech interoperability, which is educational technology kind of interoperability. And we did that to ensure the highest level of interoperability and compatibility with courseware tools. So our newly launched uh, LTI integration is 1.3. That's our protocol. And it's, it's gonna allow for even tighter integration. For those who are wondering kind of what else we're doing um, for, for our future roadmap, I'm really excited to announce, and, and you might be the first to be hearing this, so shush. Um, we're adding Chatbot AI to our LibAnswers tool, which um, allows patrons to kind of interact with the chatbot. So it gives them that chat experience. And if you're integrating your chat tool into courseware, it does give them that feeling of chatting with a librarian, even though you're not, maybe it's two in the morning and you're not technically online. And it gives them that chatbot experience, being able to retrieve your robust FAQs. Um, another way that we're addressing this, you know, uh, this post-COVID uh, need for, for targeted point of need resources is our partnership and tight integration with, with Lean Library. So we have just started um, this, this road. We're really excited about it, which is we've integrated LibGuides with the Lean Library's future and the Lean Library um, workflow for LibGuides um, browser plugin tools that allows you to integrate LibGuides right at the point of need when they're in their browser, right? So for example, um, if they're in Google Scholar, and they're doing a, a search, the Google Scholar LibGuide can appear and kind of help them perform a better search. Um, additionally, we just recently announced our LibChat integration with Lean Library. So when they're in Google Scholar and they're not even on the library webpage, they can interact with the librarian and get help, get chat help. So not only providing resources at the point of need, but also providing chat reference services really right when, in, when they need it. 
Um, so those are the things we're um, working on and, and hopefully seems to address kind of the, the new normal that we're all experiencing and uh, all a little unsure of. Um, so I'm excited to hear any questions that you all have um, and, and any feedback. So I'll turn it back over to Tony. Thank you, Talia. And uh, thanks to all the panelists for um, just giving us an update on how things are going post COVID, both at your organizations and your companies. Um, I'm curious uh, to hear from everyone else as well, but I also just wanted to share an update on kind of where we fit into this conversation at SkillType because we don't work with patrons at all. We have the luxury of only working with library staff and trying to understand what your needs are uh, with training and development, with talent management. Um, just on this webinar alone, we've heard about a dozen different tools and services that each have their own updates, each have their own ways of helping you serve the needs of your patrons. But how do you keep up with those developments? How do you find the right information about that tool or service at the right time? Um, and that's what libraries are experiencing by signing up for skill type, um, because we understand each librarian that has to manage these services has an increasingly full plate. There's not as much time or bandwidth to attend all the webinars and go to the conferences. Our travel budgets have been cut. And so this is an area that we're seeking to help in the workflow of how we identify the best services and make sure we stay abreast of these developments so that we can continue having uh, increased user satisfaction uh, uh, as we deliver these services. Um, and so we have several questions um, coming up both in the chat area and in the Q&A. If I could ask the assistance of Courtney to help me navigate this. And so I'll start by working through the chat uh, and perhaps you could take a look at the Q&A. And uh, I'm just gonna go right to uh, back to the top here. Um, and uh, the first, um, I, I just see a lot of um, uh, validation for some of the directions that um, we're discussing as solutions to this challenge. Um, we see a comment here from um, Lucy Harrison. Uh, I love the idea of embedding the library into the patron's natural workflow. Uh, that seems to be one of the through lines of, of, of all of the remarks shared today. Um, we do have a question here from Sherry Edwards um, for Matt. What was the sample size of the survey data you presented? If you could talk more a bit about that. Absolutely. Um, so it was 4,000 librarians and patrons in total, and it was about a 50-50 split between each. And then in terms of the segmentation of the patrons, um, I can't remember the exact percent percentages, but we broke them down into undergraduates, faculty, uh, university administrators, leaders, and others. Um, and if, in fact, if you go to the, um, the report at librarianfutures.com, we show the full breakdown of the um, demographics as well. So you can also see um, who they were and where they were from in the world as well. Great. Um, so that's about it for the chat area. Um, Courtney, it seems like the panelists have answered some of the questions presented in the Q&A, but do you mind reading them out for the rest of the audience who didn't see them? Absolutely. And if the panelists have more that they want to add to the answers that they already typed, that would be lovely as well. Um, one question uh, was to Matthias, uh, asking if he could say more about adding browsing and pushing content to cell phones. Uh, is that something users have to request in their accounts? How does it work? Kind of uh, asking for a bit more logistical insight there. Yeah, I'm happy to answer this. Uh, I, I put some answer in the in in the Q and A. Um, um, it, it, it's mostly a tool for researchers. Um, they can uh, install the app on their mobile phone, uh, build their own profile, and it helps them to get the content pushed to their own device, um, depending on their own set of preferences. Um, this tool is especially helpful if you're working in an area where lots of things are published and you can't keep keep track of everything. So it's, it's highly popular in our medical center among our researchers. Um, admittedly, it's absolutely of no use for our undergraduate law students. Um, so that's what, that's what I meant with this multi-channeling. You have 
so many tools, so many tricks and services, but it's it's so hard to, to target it right on the specific user you have in mind. And I see there's also one 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 uh, remark in the Q and A. Um, I see some remark from, from Anna Fleming says, working in a specialized library, I wonder if anyone has heard of current surveys that address how expert or experienced searches respond to contextual help. I would be really curious to, to, to learn about it too. It, actually, at, at my library, we, we are currently not capable of identifying a, the type of user beforehand um, and see whether it's a senior researcher or an undergraduate student and everything in between. Thanks for that answer. Um, I noticed we have another question in the chat from Joanna. How do we ensure, and this is a question to all the panelists, how do we ensure that the increasing number of open access resources are also discoverable? I'd be happy to pop in on this one just to start. Mm -hmm. This is a really, uh, this is a great question and one that I don't feel that we have figured out I don't believe that there is a really solid answer or you know, sort of solid blend of tactics that we've taken here that um, I could call a, a really you know, good strategy, but I'll point toward more tools that we are trying, that we've tried to use at University of Florida recently. So um, I don't know if folks are familiar with LibKey Nomad. It's a, um, a browser extension that once you identify which institution you're affiliated with, you could be roaming around on the web and Wikipedia or you know, your favorite media source of choice. And there will be a little icon that um, pops up that tells you, hey, you have access to this article through your library or um, because it's openly accessible. So it helps to crawl and pull in not only library subscribed resources based on your institution, but also open access resources around the web. Um, and then we're also, so one thing I failed to mention is that not only, you know, did University of Florida, of course, um, it totally disrupt our workflows during COVID, but we also migrated to an entirely new ILS and discovery system during um, remote work during COVID. And so we migrated to um, the Ex Libris' Alma. And so we've been trying to make use of their options for providing an open access, like one click get straight to the PDF um, within Primo Discovery Service. So uh, these are great tools. The challenge still lies in people knowing that they exist. How do people know to install and activate LibKey Nomad? You know, how is this getting pushed to them? How are they gonna know that these things um, are out there for them and, and you know, helping to make their discovery journey more fruitful? And that's a challenge that I don't know how to, to to answer. I will say, and this is potentially unpopular, and I hate that I keep invoking the G word, y'all, um, but sometimes I wonder at the importance or prioritization of making open access resources discoverable through library discovery channels if we know that our users are not starting in library discovery in the first place. If they're already starting in Google or Google Scholar, those open access resources are there. Um, and it's Again, it's the, you know, drinking from the fire hose. It's not like using Google is somehow better. And I don't want library discovery to turn into Google. But that's something that we grapple with is, is this really our top priority, integrating open access resources into library discovery if we know that our users don't go there first anyway? So. Yeah, Google's been mentioned, obviously, numerous times today. I'm curious for those working with Google Scholar How's it working with Google Scholar? Is this an actual team? Uh, is it just a website? Um, I remember the last time I plugged into that conversation, I discovered there were about seven Google employees or so working on this. I know it was a side project that was created out of Google's 20% time policy. Um, it's not a core part of their, their business and revenue, which is advertising. And so I'm just curious, how is it working and integrating with Google Scholar? Is it responsive? Um, is that a service that libraries can rely on? Um, uh, or will it go away? Like many other Google apps and products over the years? I could uh, speak to that from a, a, a vendor perspective. Um, so I, I know the Google Scholar have 
good relationships with publishers uh, and librarians um, in terms of you know embedding um, full text links within the searches. Um, from a vendor perspective, when you're trying to help enhance Google Scholar, I think they um, they seem to be comfortable with you doing that uh, as a browser extension, um, at providing that um, you're not you're not worsening the experience that they envisage for their users. So not uh, you know overlaying any information or um, inhibiting users from seeing the information that Google Scholar has provided itself. Um, but as you intimated, Tony, with the um, with the size of the team, I think that apart from the key pub the, the large publisher relationships they have and with libraries to help support them for the full text links, I think that um, it's it's not really possible to have a close integration relationship with them as a vendor because they just don't have the resource to support you. So they're kind of happy, a bit like the Chrome store itself, they're kind of happy for you to get on with it as long as you uh, do so in a way that uh, is appropriate and within, within their policies. Right? Great. So there is an actual group of people. It's not like, a, you know, there is source, or open source project that, you know, may not have gotten any commitments in a while. So it is like there's a people you can email or there is. I don't know if that's public, or, but you can. There is definitely a group. Um, OK. And it's headed up by uh, Anurag, who um, is a very impressive individual, like started it right from the beginning. So they have Good a real, to know. real mission there and a real, as you say, back to the 20 percent of Google piece. They have a um, as I. I know that there's that challenge, as you say, of like Microsoft Academic Search um, going away, and also Meta.ai. If, if um, folks are familiar with that, which incidentally was intended to be a kind of Uber discovery tool for open access content, but has now also gone away since Facebook sort of took the brand name away from them. So there is that danger. But I think with Google Scholar, it feels like an unlikely one. It's, it's good to know because going back to some of Aaron's remarks just on sort of user interface fatigue and all of the different interfaces that come forth, um, the responsibility is on uh, librarians. Um, if the tool goes away, um, the patrons are going to complain to the to the library staff, and and so um, this is a delicate dance. Um, but thanks for sharing your experience, Matt. Um, Let's see. I was going to add one note, mm -hmm. if that's okay. So, so back when I was an academic librarian at Johnson and Wales, this was this was a bit ago. Um, we had already kind of given up on the idea that that students were going to start at the library website first. We had we had stopped with that kind of preconceived notion. We um, so instead we were focusing staff time and energy on integrating library resources with Google Scholar. So that way, when they started there and they inevitably ended up on an article, it would say this, uh, this article was provided by your, you know, your access to Johnson & Wales because we knew that they were gonna start there. <laughs> they, weren't gonna, they weren't gonna start in the website. We wanted them to have access to the very expensive resources that we were paying uh, and, and, and that they were paying for out of their tuition. Um, so we were, we were thinking of this, um, this push of info and resources into Google Scholar rather than a pull of getting them to come to the library. Um, so I'm sure that is probably still the case. Um, and many of, uh, I'm seeing Erin uh, nodding her head. So I'm assuming that's probably still the case as well. But I, I remember that very distinctly, you know, quite a, quite a bit ago that that was our new you know, our new road that we were, that we were undertaking. Um, doesn't seem like it's changed. So. I have another question that I'll throw out, uh, just noticing we have um, members from the community uh, on the, in the audience. Um, a lot of our patrons, by virtue of their uh, attending our institutions, have access to resources outside of ours through our consortial relationships. If you could just um, open question to the panel, um, how have you seen those relationships you have um, with these larger networks um, improving or harming um, the experience you deliver to, to, to patrons?
is there any feedback for um, uh, the consortial office on? Well, mm -hmm. this is a little bit of a tough one. I don't know that our users are aware at all that mm -hmm. There, that there is the existence of a consortia and the existence of the library and that there are, you know, kind of subsets of collections coming from one pipe or the other. It really, the challenge, I think, lies on those of us managing those resources in our integrated library systems. I find that the next gen, you know, responsive cloud-based systems do offer more specific places where consortia live, you know, a network zone, a consortia zone, for example, so that it is a little bit easier to separate out on the library side, what's coming from which pipe, but on the user side, it doesn't seem like there's much difference for them as far as what they're experiencing. It's, I mean, it's great for us because it means that we're, um, uh, you know, able to provide more content that we wouldn't be able to out on our own, just, you know, blowing in the wind, we're able to get access to a lot more and provide, um, you know, deeper content for our user community through our consortia. But again, that also, everything just kind of tracks back to the uh, option bloat that I mentioned earlier, which sounds like I'm complaining about having a lot of resources, which I know sounds awful and no one should complain about, but, you know, we, I think uh, those of us who work on the back end of managing those resources can say that, you know, sometimes it's a, um, a wealth of problems. Yeah, the paradox of choice. Thanks, Courtney. Yeah, if I can chip in, I think it's also depend on the region where you are. Um, at least in the Netherlands, the consortium is a source of efficiency, but not necessarily of, of quality for our users. Um, we, we more or less have the same digital collections, which is very convenient for us. Um, but but our, our users wouldn't know and they don't need to know. Um, it, it, it's different for specialized researchers who sometimes need access to printed resources. Um, so, so we have a, 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 a neat system of interlibrary loan, as we used to call it. Uh, we frame it differently now, but it's, it's it, basically it's the same as, as, as interlibrary loan. Um, well, it, it, it's a source of efficiency, but not necessarily quality. Um, yeah, I just think about sort of the future of interlibrary loan um, and, you know, how that traditionally meant, you know, I'm, putting a, a book on hold that has to be driven over, but, you know, in an electronic resource environment and in an increasingly digital environment, um, what type of opportunities are there for a consortium to facilitate presenting the right resources at the right time from an electronic perspective? Um, just uh, uh, some questions, sort of food for thought. Um, as we have about eight minutes left, um, are there any sort of final remarks from the panelists uh, for the audience? Um, I think this was a pretty broad ranging discussion. Um, are there any takeaways um, for folks as they uh, go off and try to continue doing the hard work of meeting user needs? Any advice? I, I, I was gonna pipe in and just say, um... I think libraries in a really are, are, are in a really tough spot because we're competing for eyeballs. Libraries are competing for eyeballs against, you know, commercial products. And but they also are, as Stephen noted in um, in the chat, they are balancing that with user privacy. And it's it's really kind of a breaking ground because patrons and students expect a level of service because they're getting it elsewhere. They're getting it from Google, they're getting it from Amazon, they're getting this, this level of, of personalization, of targeted resources, of if you like this, then you'll like that. And they're not thinking about their user privacy, but we are required to think of their user privacy, or libraries are required to think of their user privacy. And so how do you, how do you balance that? And what is, what is that future going to be like with providing that commercial experience with out, um, so, you know, sacrificing the privacy of the patron. I could potentially uh, jump in, Tony, if you like. I, I just completely agree with uh, what Talia said. Um, I think uh, on a 
a different tack. I was going to return back to the challenge of of the library addressing some of these problems, and it can seem um, it's such a massive universe to engage with. Uh, and I think what um, the approach that we've taken as a vendor is to try and be holistic about it, and if that works well for us because what we're saying is, you know, the way we address our particular problem of how you download a browser extension and will they, won't they, is well try to make the browser extension about not not one trick pony, but basically everything the library has, and therefore that'll maximize the use case, and therefore they will they will uh, they will come as they say. Um, but I think that holistic approach could also be applied to lots of other um, tools and approaches that the library might take. I was interested to hear um, some of the audience talking about integration with the learning management system. I think that's that's obviously fantastic. That's where the users are. There's so much. There's already so much that's been done there, and so much more that could be done. Um, but I think um, if you look at it in the round, I think uh, it is possible. And I think the um, the final thing is that the the survey results do show that there is appetite for it amongst patrons. And so I don't feel the library should think that the um, that the the sort of job has gone away from them now, and it's just Google and Amazon. And I think the library is arguably more relevant than ever with disinformation, all the open access out that they need to find, and much more. I'd leave things, you know, by with it with a bit of a plea, which is, you know, we can't do this alone. And I'm one of the worst perpetrators of this is, you know, beating my head against the wall by myself for eight hours before reaching out for help and then resolving it in 15 minutes. And it's not like we're going to resolve the problems of library discovery tomorrow, but I think we have to reach out and realize that we're, we're not going to solve it ourselves in our own institutions. We need to be working with vendor partners and systems partners and be part of those conversations. And as much as we voice our frustrations around how these systems operate. They won't operate better if we aren't part of the, the solution. And then Stephen Bell makes a, a good point in the comments, in the chat comments about um, responsibility of faculty. I absolutely do believe that there is some responsibility on the teaching faculty and um, you know, our support systems here in the university and in higher education that um, we can't make <laughs> teaching faculty respect us, but um, we can help, you know, move that dial by reaching out and uh, being part of their conversations and part of their curriculum more. But the, the, the main thing I wanted to mention was something that Talia had touched on earlier, which is um, we can't discount the immense labor burden that um, the work of library discovery puts on library staff and it does affect morale it is very, very hard to put blood, sweat, and tears into building up the integrity of a system and then hear offhand comments about how bad that system is from our, our user community. And that's the that's the nature of our work and that's how it's always gonna be. And you know, I embrace it with cheer, but um, there is a reality that this takes a toll on our, our teams and, and on the morale of our teams. And so that's something that I think we really need to think about is, um, is there room for keeping things simple sometimes rather than chasing every shiny path, which can end up um, turning out to not be what we thought it was gonna be. Well, on that note, I think that's a perfect summary of kind of where things um, uh, are. We do have a question from Suzanne asking about the differences between the European patron experience and the American patron experience. Um, I'll just put a plug for the fact that this webinar has been recorded. And so we had a dialogue towards the beginning where Matthias and Aaron kind of compared notes on their experiences. Um, I just want to thank Charleston for hosting today's event and all the attendees for making time. Uh, if you liked this webinar and would like to see more of them, uh, please follow Charleston on social media um, because they're promoting these types of events. Um, that try to bring a balanced perspective uh, from both vendors and, and libraries. Um, if you have stories that you want to share from your institution, um, contact Charleston uh, with ideas to present these webinars um, throughout the year. Uh, so I hope everyone has a productive rest of the week and um, please share the recording with your colleagues uh, if you have time. Uh, thanks to everyone and see you next time.